Good morning, New Orleans. Ten years after Katrina, and we are still here, bastards. The weather's hot, and today the Basque musician Fermin Muguruza, who interviewed here last year, is coming to New Orleans to meet different musicians and give their tracks that New Orleans flavor. It's going to be a New Orleans Basque clash, so to speak. We're going to follow the recording process and keep you all updated about it. So, welcome to the Crescent City, the big not so easy, the city that care for God. If you look at the trees or any type of vegetation in New Orleans, it's thick. You know, it's like the grass is thicker, the trees are thicker, it's warm, it's hot, it's humid, and it just like, you know, hovers over you like a blanket, like a hot blanket. And that, that's how the music is here. It's, it's kind of lazy, but it's, it's got, it's real thick, you know, the groove is like real thick. The weather, the heat, the humidity affects the wood of the cello, you know. It makes my cello sound a certain way. You know, I'm not a uh, classically pristine environment for my cello anymore. Yeah, definitely. The, the climate is a big part of my playing and developing a sound. And also, you know, water in the air, the humidity in the air, it carries sound differently. Things sound different. You can hear the frogs at night and the crickets and the, yeah, the air is gritty down here. I go out into the swamps here, sit out, uh, I go far out usually, go out in the canoe or I walk out into the water with my boots on and I sit down, I'm inspired to be in a natural setting and, and write about life. It gives me a time and space to be able to think about real solutions to problems that I might have or that are things that I see in the world. So my whole world of music is completely married and tied together with uh, the natural world. Ten years after the federal levy failure, as other people know it as Hurricane Katrina, over 80% of the city was underwater, one of our darkest chapters in American history, a toxic combination of government neglect and socioeconomic inequality turned a crisis into a tragedy. And this is the worst thing about it. The media treated us like we were refugees in our own country. The circumstances were curious because it was a man-made disaster. The part of it that caused the evacuation, which was the disruptive part, and the death was because of the failure of the levees. And then following that, the failure of the United States government to respond in any kind of humane way. One million people needed to evacuate from New Orleans or thereabouts. and, and uh, as I said, if you take a city away from its city, you, you can find out the results very quickly of what happens when you take man out of his environment by force. Horrible things happen psychically and physically, but what was more 
difficult about it is that instead of trying to understand it, the media of the world looked at it as we were refugees. They called us and said, can y'all please come home and play? Please come. And we hadn't seen each other in a month or two. And uh, we said, okay, we'll do that. So the band's first time seeing each other um, since the flooding. We, we showed up, the city was pitch black. There was only lights right in the area where the club was. And there was still debris in the street, trees down, cars on top of roof tops. And when I turned the corner to play to the club, there was a whole block filled with people waiting on us. And that was amazing to me. After Katrina, I really knew that New Orleans was my home because I, uh, it's like having a sick family or friend in the hospital and you, you want to go right away to be near that person. So I came and I wanted to be back here. Uh, immediately I knew it in my, in my bones that I needed to be back here. So when we came back down here and it was, I can't express um, the sadness, the emotions I had, it was, it was, it was pretty sad. And I went into the bywater, it was all full of barbed wire, it was like a war zone. Uh, looked like Sarajevo a long time ago, you know? When I came back, you know, of course I cried, you know? And uh, I'm sure there were some things that were rebuilt, in it, you know, by that time, but it's, it hasn't, you know, really fully come back. That disaster and that happened, I think musicians as a whole kind of got together, you know, whether they knew it or not. <clears throat> and just that whole experience made the music stronger. Check, 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 check. The moment and the first time that I came back home after Hurricane Katrina to play here in New Orleans was very special and it was a feeling that I've never had before. Um, to give you an idea, it was like we've played for many jazz funerals for people, but this time the funeral was for our city. The whole city of New Orleans had died and we had to be resurrected back from the water, not the ashes, but water. We have New Orleans in our blood, so we came back to NOLA. We call everybody else to return and rebuild the city while the Republican Richard Baker, U.S. Representative of Louisiana, he said, well, we finally cleaned up public housing in New Orleans. We couldn't do it, but God did. Son of a bitch he is. Then we get back to this point again, but now we're heading to Preservation Hall, where Muguruza is recording one track with the historical band of Ben Jaffe.
when Preservation Hall opened its doors, first in the 1950s and then formally in 1961, this was one of the few places where we're sitting right here, right now, was the only place in the French Quarter and in New Orleans where blacks and whites could congregate openly and were encouraged to socialize. A lot of this music that we play is not, it's not written. I've never seen music for it, but uh, I've learned it from the older guys. And this is what we're doing here now at Preservation Hall. We have the, the Preservation Hall Foundation, which sponsors young people to come in and learn to play music. We live music every day. Music is such a part uh, of our everyday lives from, um, from parties to our jazz funerals. And, um, and we celebrate. We celebrate everything through music. We celebrate life through music. It's so uh, ingrained in us that um, we have to perpetuate it. We, uh, it's a responsibility that we have to, to keep it going and, and to enrich the lives of others you know, through our music. There's definitely a balance between keeping the tradition preserved and then seeking out new ways of being creative within that tradition. So I think this is kind of a, a natural progression for them to, um, to reconnect or to continue to connect with the musical community worldwide. <laughs> always around pianist and just like a lot of the guys in the band the family that preceded them they were musicians Charlie Gabriel he's the oldest member in the band he's 83 now and and he's the seventh generation musician in his family try again try again one two huh? try again touch me again whatever you would okay. do one My family, they moved into New Orleans back in 1841. My family came, came in from Singer Dominguez. My great grandfather was a bass player, and uh, my grandfather was a accordion player, and uh, my dad was uh, a drummer. Though I played, thought played with the Rico Jazz Band in 1943, and there was a lot of older musicians in the band that I was playing with, because I was only 11 years old, and those guys was around. 30 and 35 years old, so they all gone now. So I'm the last of those musicians during that period of time. I wind up doing different things with uh, a lot of blues band like Johnny e. Hooker and Bobby Blue Bland and those type of musicians. And I joined Rita Franklin band in 1969. <laughs> and Havana and Port-au-Prince are, have had, or had for many centuries, um, open trade between these three ports. This was the major uh, trading triangle in the Caribbean. New Orleans and Cuba, particularly Havana, the trade was so great between these two cities for so many centuries, going back to the, the 1500s, that it's almost impossible to imagine we would have jazz today if there was not an, an, an influx of musicians and music to New Orleans from Cuba. And I would venture to say that there wouldn't be Cuban music today that we know without an influx of New Orleans musicians to Cuba. That's how strong the connection is. And that's why I'm so excited to go to Cuba, because I'm going to learn something about myself. I'm going to learn something about the, mu the, 
the, the, the place where I come from. I'm going to understand more about myself by understanding something I know very little about. And this is an amazing time for us to go to Havana because of the, the recent lifting of the embargo. And I know that, you know, things uh, are going to evolve quickly. And I wanted to go before, um, you know, before I, before McDonald's moves to Cuba. Katrina, what made me change my whole concept coming back home, because Katrina, I watched that on the TV, Now it just it was, it was just so heartbreaking, because all my relatives that was living in New Orleans, lost, a lot of them lost everything they had, and some of them came to Detroit, and I tried to house some of them, you know, and some of them went to Texas and so forth. And New Orleans was suffering and trying to survive, and it looked like my city was gonna just be washed away. I couldn't take that. Those events, those um, tragic events that happen in our lives leave an emotional scar on our soul. They need this musician to come back home. came back and joined the band and uh, ever since and Benji and I we just just hooked up together just like that for centuries people have paid a dear price for New Orleans to be what it is you know a very painful price yeah, and that's um, important to me to honor them to remember them to never forget them to never forget why I'm here today. It's because somebody else at another time in history suffered greater than I can ever imagine so that I could be here today. New Orleans calling, it's carnival time. Nothing stops carnival. The first Mardi Gras after Katrina, the first meeting of the people, the gathering of the people, the call for coming back and celebrating life. It's carnival time. And in New Orleans, you become part of it. One of our guests this week is the great documentary filmmaker, Aaron Walker. His Bury the Hatchet is a milestone in documenting black Mardi Gras traditions in New Orleans. there's a tradition in the African-American communities where the, some members of the community dress up in Native American costumes with feathers and these head garbs and these are suits that they sew the entire year. These, these are descendants of 
uh, runaway slaves from you know, 100, 150, 200 years ago that would run away from the plantations and run into the, into the swamps, into the bayous. And in the bayous, they were giving, given refuge by the, uh, the Native Americans. And several times a year, especially on Mardi Gras, they dress up and these costumes and they go out and they, they parade through the streets. The first Mardi Gras after Katrina, it was, I think that it was essential that we celebrated Mardi Gras. It was, it was, if we didn't celebrate Mardi Gras, that means we were dead. Big Chief Monk Boudreau, in his interview, uh, I went to his house, Lundi Gras Eve, and he's there, and he's not happy, he's very depressed, but he's sewing his suit, getting ready, and he says, you know, we have to keep going, you know, we don't just, if there's a problem, we don't just go in the corner and cry, we have to stand up and fight and move forward. And I think it's that attitude, that resilience, that has made New Orleans come back to the New Orleans we see today for better or worse. You, you see that you know, a lot of politicians back in, in the Katrina days said, just forget about this city. It's, it's, it's below sea level, it's not protected. Why are we gonna save this city? Let's leave it, abandon it. And the people of New Orleans weren't gonna do that. After Katrina happened in 2005, it just seemed like there might not be any more city left here anymore. It seemed like people were talking about no one should move back there, the levees aren't going to hold, there's going to be another one, you know, New Orleans is finished. So I felt like I needed to move here then to see, you know, how that history was going to unfold. <laughs> For me, moving to New Orleans, I mean, right after Katrina, there were so many people doing so much media about Katrina, that I felt, and so many of them were not from here. That was the thing. People from all over the world and all over America came here to make pieces about New Orleans, but 95% of them had never been here before. So it was a very sort of like dogmatic outsider approach to it. And I knew that I didn't want to be one of those voices and that, you know, doing that. So for me, you know, it's also, I knew that I just moved here. I didn't know the city. You know, I didn't understand the nuances that were happening in the city. So for me, it was much more important to be able to train other people who live here to tell their own stories. I started a group called New Orleans Video Voices, and it was, it was started specifically to, to enable community groups to tell their own stories. I think the documentary provides uh, historical evidence for mankind that, that, that helps us as, a, as humans, it helps us understand our past, helps us understand the present, um, and also helps us avoid mistakes in the future. There's, there's a cult of authenticity and an attempt to understand what's authentic and what's real. And this is something that's never concerned me because I always assumed that what I was doing was real. And reimagining and playing the traditional forms is a filthy habit that I cannot quit. I love to do it. Uh, it's a party song, Mess Around, you know? Great, great, mess, uh, great party song. So, uh, 
to put that in another language besides English. I think that's great. That was The Mess Around by Ray Charles from Congo Square where the slaves gathered to dance to Louis Armstrong to jazz. This dancing tradition, one of the things about the voodoo tradition is dancing, is to become ridden by the loa or the spirits via transferring the ecstasy of drumming and dancing. A spirit is not confined to time or space, however. There are several things that a mortal can do that a loa cannot eat, drink, dance, smoke, and have sexual relations. But the Loa come into our bodies to experience the world again. The musical rhythms are used to call the spirits who may possess the dancers and then engage in all of these activities. A West African word for sex, by the way, is jazz, J-A-S-S, or as we call it today, jazz. The power of voodoo, the ancient beliefs and drums were brought to New Orleans by many and carried by one great woman, Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen, the most widely known of many practitioners of this tradition in New Orleans. The Spanish Inquisition persecuted heretics, especially in the Basque country where the Acalare gathered. The witches. This track speaks about the witches sound. Zugarumuri. came here from Africa, from the Dahomey people that came into this area in New Orleans. Some people came out of the Caribbean as well, and they brought all of these practices uh, with them. And they combined them also with what uh, Native American Indians had here. You might see a voodoo shop on Bourbon Street, but that's not really what we do with voodoo. We use voodoo to heal people um, and to be able to, to bring about good things in their life. What we call a healer or a treater, traiter. Um, that's the natural thing, using plants, uh, herbs, and prayer. It's how you say it. Since I became a gay rapper, it's been going on 17 years now. And homophobic, it was, it was like being on the one. I'm gonna say like the whole popular out, out of 100, out a popular except 100, homophobic had to be like, I mean, I'm gonna say at least 60%. I mean, I'm gonna say at least 40% out of the 100 was like homophobic. But now it's like, it's only 20%. Like, you see what I'm saying? It's like 20, maybe 15. It may be 10% that's, that's homophobic, you know, it's like, who knows, like, but because it's like, it's, it's everywhere now. Like, gays making music in New Orleans and stuff, it's everywhere now. Yeah! Oh! Come on, come on, come on, come on! Yes, I'm a witch, yes, I'm a witch, call me a witch, cause I'm a witch. Anytime in New Orleans, you can be free. Anytime, in, it's like a New Orleans is do what you want to see. I, I say that all the time. That makes them crazy. Just because they can do what you want, you know, they make them crazy. But just don't get caught by the police so you can go to jail. But 
et buvez ces deux jours. We did a certain amount of hip hop in our studio, enough so I knew the folklore of the different policemen that would shake down all the drug dealers. So I was riding my bike home one night and the cops came up behind me, put their lights on and I stopped and they said, you know, what are you doing? I said, I'm riding home. They said, no, you're not. You must be looking for drugs. I'm like, no, I'm not looking for drugs. I'm, I'm riding home. They say, let me see your license. When's the last time you saw a crackhead with a bike helmet on? So then they like, pow, boom, bam. So they throw me in the back and just drive me around, cursing me out. And I start cursing them out. So it's like we're having a curse battle. And I say, I'm 50 years old. You really want to do this to me? And they're like, fuck you, you bitch, you know, and they're just carrying on. And I won't even say the officer's name. He, I think he's probably still on the force. And he's still taking that hundred bucks a day from the dealers on the corners in his neighborhood, which allows him to take vacations and put his kids in Catholic school. This is how it works around here. And it's everyone will say, oh, of course. Not. Anyway, so finally they put me in jail. They put me, I have to sit in Central. I put the orange outfit on. I have to sit in there with armed robbers. So finally they let me out. And I make my phone calls. And I have friends who are, you know, the mayor, the mayor's brother. So by the time I make it back to my studio, the police chief of that precinct came over and visited me and said, well, we're really sorry. What do we do? So I didn't feel like telling us, you know, it was like, nah, suspension. Nah. I saw they had to do anger management for a year. That was good punishment. I think it's actually worse in New Orleans and America. Have you noticed all the people that have been killed by police? And, uh, and there's a huge industry in America to incarcerate black, young black men. You know? I mean, huge billion dollar industry across America to prisons. They, it goes back to Ronald Reagan. It goes back to privatizing everything. The privatization of all America has led to all kind of huge wealth and way worse off for poor people. But then it's like New Orleans. They say, oh, New Orleans is way better. Yeah, right. Better for who? Fleeing the Inquisition, Jean Lafitte's family arrived in France. Sephardic French father and Spanish mother, the most widespread version is that he was born in Biarritz in the northern Basque country. With his crew of a thousand men, Lafitte is credited with the decisive naval intervention in the Battle of New Orleans. Jean Lafitte, although devoted to the slave trade, is still a romantic figure in Louisiana. Popular legends attribute to him being saved from shipwrecks, storms, and diverse dangers. There is another legend that links this pirate with the first edition of the Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx. This city really, really gives um, people the opportunity to feel a lot of pride and a sense of community when you play music. You have a purpose, you have a, a way to give to your community, you have respect. The connection in between the music and the community in New Orleans is, it's, it's ever present. You want to be careful not to step on the great traditions of 
of this city, but it's always been somewhere, in my understanding, that's had people from all over the world saying, wow, this is, what a great place. I want to move here. I want to be a part of what's going on here. It's, it's a side of life that America typically doesn't embrace. It's not all about production and how much work can you do and how hard can you work and how much money you can make. It's definitely a lot more about quality of life, enjoying yourself, and just moving a little slower. <laughs> I want to help people, make it a therapeutic thing, you know what I mean? Rather than, rather than taking from people or whatever, just kind of just giving, you know, the best that I can. The best that I can do is play right now. It's such a great feeling to perform at home because it's almost, um, it's your own, it's, it, you're grounded. It's where your foundation is. And for me to perform at home, it's like my spirit is being fed. It's very important for us to be conscious in our music and what we're saying and to express the emotions of the people of our community. Storm is coming to The community of New Orleans rebuilt this city. Even if 10 years after Katrina, New Orleans has become gentrification ground zero. According to historian Megan French Marcelin, she dissects the city's redevelopment and rebranding into a neoliberal playground for young entrepreneurs. One need only look at the harrowing weeks and months after the storm, she writes, to see that reconstruction would be used to implement a series of revengeness reforms that further deregulated labor, undermine unions, diminish educational and employment opportunities for working class people, and excise public and affordable housing from the speculative urban landscape. Or as Naomi Klein says, the final showdown over New Orleans public housing is playing out in dramatic fashion right now. The conflict is a classic example of the triple shock formula at the core of the doctrine. First came the original disaster, the flood and the traumatic evacuation. Next came the economic shock therapy, using the window and opportunity opened up by the first shock to push through a rapid fire attack on the city's public services and spaces, most notably its homes, schools, and hospitals. Now we see that as residents of New Orleans try to resist these attacks, they are being met by a third shock, the shock of the police baton and the taser gun used on the bodies of the protesters outside City Hall yesterday. Disaster capitalism is big business. So the way New Orleans is now was designed. It was, goes back to Milton Friedman, it goes back to classic 
economics, you know, pirate capitalism, see a weakness, see a place that they can come and take over and rebuild, make all the money off it. It doesn't matter if it changes the character of the city. Most of that, it was just moving money around. I mean, and not a whole lot of that was actually spent on resources for the community. And I, I think in like Hurricane Rita, I think it was something to the tune of one dollar of every three hundred dollars actually went to relief. You know what I mean? Natural disasters are going to be more frequent if we stay on the path that we're on. Um, it's really hard with New Orleans because we're the you know Louisiana is such a big center of oil and gas in this in this country, and so it's a little bit like being in the belly of the beast. <laughs> It's not free market capitalism like you know you were thought we're taught about in school. It's the new you know shark variation hedge fund no holds barred steal lie steal cheat kill capitalism so it's interesting that you know humanity has moved forward in so many ways and then moved backwards if it wasn't for the people of the neighborhoods a lot of our city would still not be put back together it was the diligence and the resilience of someone's uncle, a grandfather, a brother, a cousin, and coming and gutting out the house and putting up sheetrock and putting down new floors. It took the resilience of those families and the people and the community to do so because so many people were ripped off by insurance companies or contractors and didn't have any more money, so they had to work hard. They may have lived in one room and then slowly but surely got every other room together to actually have a complete home. And it's the resilience of our people and our community that did that. Because, you know, a lot of us was left by the wayside. So if it wasn't for us and having that will, that strong will to bring our city back to what it once was, we wouldn't have New Orleans today. People in America buy into that. They think it's wonderful. They, everyone thinks New Orleans is way better now. They got rid of 100,000 black people and they think it's better because of that. Because, oh, there's less, well, there's still just as much crime. Hmm, how does that work out? So, you know, I've been complaining. We're past gentrification now. It's touristification. <laughs> Capitalism has taken hold even more with the militarism and the global, America is the global protector of not just American corporations, but the oil and the corporate interests around the world. So really we have this, aside from few places, the world has become one big, you know, shopping mall. This celebration of life and to know how we deal with death, you need to join the second lines. Muguruza covered Kermit Ruffin's track to dedicate her personal manager, Amaya Apaloza, who died a few months ago by cancer. One of her dreams was to come to New Orleans with Fermin for this recording, but now we can fill her with us down to the Mississippi River.
In New Orleans, we celebrate life, we celebrate death, but we celebrate the life of that person who has passed on. To be able to express that musically is a great thing for us as a city and as a culture, to be able to get in the streets and dance and second line, just to acknowledge that and absorb that and to be able to express it, it's a great, great, great thing for us. The way that the parades used to happen, there was a first line, what they called a first line, which was a very uh, regimented, structured um, way, a, a very literal way of reading the music, of structuring the society. And then there was the concept of a second line of people. That was the people that would follow the parade from behind. And their music was interpretive and designed to trigger another kind of dancing. And there's no doubt that this comes off of very wonderful folk forms and all kinds of derivations of things there that are, that are there to provide real excitement and, and uh, transcendental transformation out of people. This is, what, this is what that is, and that's the second line. The second line is really the spirit of the people. I think most musicians make music that they want to make and then try to sell it. Figure out, or they make music that they see other people successfully selling and then try to sell the same music. I don't think that that's a community-focused undertaking, with the, with, the, with the very notable exceptions of the African-American brass band that's the big exception. These, that music is for the community. It serves social functions, birthdays, funerals, Sunday second lines. That's a community activity, very much so. Even though I, I can't parade with my cello very easily, but I still try. I have an amplifier and I, I try to march in the parades. It's pretty funny. <laughs> The idea that there are people that are so callous and so unrefined that they walk in, buy a house, or buy many houses in a neighborhood, and think that they, they, they imagine in their head that that has more value then the thing that they're listening to without understanding it is so, again, inhumane and disgusting. The idea that property is supposed to be better than something that took hundreds of years of a kind of very subtle brilliance that they can't even understand to generate. And the neighborhood associations are very, like, fascist. So all the fascist element of America coming out, ah, you know, and it's, it's there. In other words, if you kill second line culture because it's noisy, then what you do is you can build another house, but it would, might, it would take you hundreds of years to reproduce a culture that might produce something as brilliant as, as the natural occurrence of a second line. The culture, the music, the food is all one thing. You can't expect to move into a neighborhood that is the birthplace of jazz, of all things, where they have second lines every week 
if not every other couple days, you know, just for somebody or for something. You can't expect to change the culture that makes this city so unique. So I, I hate that there are new people moving in who don't see that because these are the things that make New Orleans what New Orleans is. It's time also to be remembering when New Orleans didn't seem to be in the U.S. We are another occupied city, invaded by the American army after the war in Iraq, this war on terror, this terrorism American style. Help us. But as we sang during civil rights time, we shall overcome one day. Very close friend of mine. He's one happens to be one of the most witty, uh, most uh, satirical songwriters in New Orleans now. His name's Alex McMurray, and uh, Alex wrote a song called "My Man, My Man, Take Me Back to the War," which was about the soldiers because they came here. The, the, the people that came to uh, look, to deal with New Orleans after the evacuation were soldiers that were fresh from Iraq. And so he envisioned this great blues song of these guys going, you know, describing all of this terrible stuff that they had, that they saw here and saying, take me back to the war, it's better over there. <laughs> So many times, if you read it in a book, in a history book or something like, it's been changed or it's been altered, but with music, you can tell the absolute truth. That's what blues music comes from, spiritual music here, uh, all in, in the New Orleans area in South Louisiana. Uh, that's what it's all about. It's about teaching how to survive uh, through the use of music. <laughs> There's other places that have good music, but our music came from slavery until uh, now. It's everybody combining to, to make the sounds that we have now. All these different styles of music coming together, which brings all these different people together. It's an anomaly in, in American culture especially, because it's, it is one of the few places where the African culture is still so firmly rooted and there are a number of traditions that were that were brought over and kept in the culture. Um, New Orleans celebrates that fact, unlike a lot of cities. They don't try and push that culture down. And that is part of the beauty of New Orleans. that you know and this, these songs are um, it became a part of Louisiana also <laughs> Oh, 
Well, in 2013, I showed my film by Yamaha Raja, which is about James Booker, a piano player from New Orleans. I showed it in Barcelona, and it was the first time I'd ever shown it in Europe. So I flew over there to present it to the European audience. And sitting in the front row was Fermin, who I hadn't met at the time. We had a mutual friend. Um, and afterwards, you know, I was a little shy. I didn't really know anyone in Barcelona. And he came up, and he's like, I love the film. And also, you have to come see my city. So he walked around and took me into these, you know, have a juice here, have something to eat here. You have to walk down this city. Here's the history of, of this street. And I absolutely fell in love with Barcelona. But at the same time, I was like, man, you show me your city. Please come and see New Orleans. You know, it's an incredible place, but you have to experience it firsthand. And then a couple months later, here he was. Farming so played here two years ago with some musician from New Orleans, and it was wonderful. I encouraged him to do something interesting, like recording with a musician from New Orleans. So Fermin told me that he had seen, uh, on his previous trip into New Orleans, he'd seen Jello Biafra playing with a brass band, but he was playing the songs from the Dead Kennedys uh, before that, uh, and that he was interested in doing a, a, a New Orleans record with using the brass band sound the same way for his, for his songs, or similar. We met earlier in the year, and for me, he played me a number of his tracks that he was interested in doing in this way, and I was very fascinated because uh, I, I thought the music was very interesting and also meaningful and I could see a way to work it out with the knowledge that I have of, of New Orleans music. One thing I find about this project that's really, really cool is that taking Furman's punk rock songs that are just high energy and he just came down here and took our groove and put it with his songs. And I think that's really cool. I, I just, I love that concept. And that's being creative and that's, and, and, and you, Jonathan, the producer, Jonathan Fralick, everybody was handpicked for this session that is a creative person. Everybody in this whole room is just very highly creative. So it, it, it just, you know, it all plays out itself. Engineering, it's problem solving. So there are many techniques to solve whatever. The idea is you want to get the music to, to breathe, be clear, clean, get the recording to be clean, and, and the important to have the musicians play together. So in this case, we could have all those musicians playing together without overdubbing everything, which gives a very different feel. So you get, try to get a beautiful picture and have it on playback sound like it's a record already. I feel like the band fed off of Vermeen's energy and vice versa and you know they, they could see in his actions what he liked and what got him excited. For me, it's music describes to me, it's, it is a kind of a world consciousness music. And New Orleans has many uh, influences because it's been an international city for 350 years. It has many influences f from the world at different times. And those are reflected in all these styles of music that you hear here across Louisiana. And over the years, I've been in New Orleans maybe uh, 25 years now and had a great opportunity to play with a diverse number of musicians here, some of the older ones very deeply, and so um, there was a way to use many influences in Fermin's music and make it work. So what we did today, we, I mean it was phenomenal. We had a great recording session, Fermin was happy, uh, the, the technicians, the engineers, everybody happy about, about the it was a really grooving tune, and uh, we, we had fun doing it. Great project. To me, it was, it was interesting to hear Furman tell me his story and, and how he connected with the, the tragedy that happened, um, of course, Hurricane Katrina. And uh, seeing it in that light, 
sort of added a new level of depth for me. You, Fermin, and your music and your world, that's as important for us as it is for you. Not only are you getting to introduce us to your world, we get to introduce you to our world. Two-way street. Satenda, black is caras, black is pensa, black is pensa, black is pensa, black is pensa, mendera señal, marcha batera, y cortea. Belsa. That's it. How do you say black and Basque? Yeah, black is Belsa. We are out of time. <laughs>